Jeremy. Thanks a lot, Dr. Goldberg. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, as mentioned, I'm going to talk. I'm actually going to talk a little bit more uh, generally, a bit more broadly than that. I'm going to talk about surgery generally for, for high-risk prostate cancer. As with any anything related to prostate cancer, it's controversial. Uh, it's particularly controversial because we just don't know what to do. That there's not solid enough data out there to give us good, clear guidance as to how to manage best these patients. But before I go on to that, uh, just a quick little bit of background about myself. Where I'm from, as Dr. Goldenberg mentioned, I'm from Melbourne. And as you can see, that's the southeastern corner of Australia. Um, perhaps if I was giving this talk in the United States, I might have to also mention that this is located in the southern hemisphere. Um, and there's the capital, Canberra. Melbourne's not famous for a whole bunch of things, but we do have a fantastic uh, stadium. This is the Melbourne Cricket Ground, uh, lit up at night, as you can see, in the city in the background. There it is in the daytime. Seats 100,000 people. And uh, I think Dr Pickles will uh, vouch that it's a pretty good stadium. I think you were there for the um, Prostate Cancer Symposium earlier this year. So there's a couple of different sports we play at the MCG. Uh, there's Australian Rules Football uh, and Cricket, as you can see up there. And as you'll notice, uh, oh, these pictures actually represent uh, highly uh, emotional and historic moments in the history of Australian sport. And in fact, it's the only time Australian blokes are allowed to touch each other. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so you can. See, this is uh, about one one minute to go in the grand final, 2005, and this fellow in the red and white has just taken a spectacular mark in front of this pack of players, and uh, and saved the game. There was only one point of difference, uh, and this uh, is the most famous, one of the most famous players in cricket worldwide, called Shane Warne, uh, spin bowler. Unfortunately, he's more famous now for his uh, activities. Uh, off the field, uh, which involve lewd messages on cell phones. Um, but he's a fantastic uh, spin bowler. And this fellow here, Andrew Simons, uh, is also a great cricketer and he's doing his best impersonation of a urologist there. OK, but before I move on, um, these are fantastic sports, but they can't compare to this one. OK, back to business. I'd just like to outline... Uh, the talk that I'm going to present today and what I really want to try and do is, is uh, answer some of these questions. So we'll go over the definition of what high, high risk uh, clinically localised prostate cancer is and all the problems associated with that. How is this group of patients currently being managed? Uh, we'll go over some of the literature on surgery for uh, high risk prostate cancer and also as Dr Goldenberg mentioned I'm going to talk about what we found here at uh, Vancouver. I'll try and mount a case for why we should perhaps be rethinking our treatment options for these patients, not necessarily at this institution but worldwide. Uh, and I'll briefly uh, at the end, if I've got time, cover uh, what we need to do to improve our management and, and therefore what the future might hold. So the definition, we're talking about of course biopsy proven prostate cancer, no clinical evidence of metastases, so we're talking about negative bone scan, negative CT abdomen pelvis. But we're also talking about patients who have a high probability of recurrence despite definitive local monotherapy, whichever that may be. But how do we determine this? Well, we use baseline PSA, clinical stage and the biopsy Gleason score. These are the main factors that we use. But in more recent times, we've also been looking at PSA kinet kinetics such as velocity and the volume of tumour found at biopsy, the, so the percentage of uh, cores that are positive. Using all these together, there in, the, in the literature we find that there are multiple stratification methods and this introduces the first problem in defining high-risk prostate cancer. When you look across the literature, we're actually talking about a whole different bunch of patients. You're probably most familiar or maybe most familiar with the D'Amico definition which includes a PSA greater than 20 or clinical stage greater than T2C or a biopsy score of, of 8 or higher. Um, and in fact, this particular definition I notice is currently uh, in the, is in the uh, current AUA prostate cancer guidelines, but there are several others out there. Second problem is that each of the parameters used within these stratification methods predicts poorly. They do predict, but they're not that great. So PSA we know varies with, uh, it's not particularly specific, it varies with BPH, inflammation, and even the degree of differentiation of the prostate cancer. Clinical stage is highly subjective, uh, and is notoriously in inaccurate. Very, it's very common for clinical stage T2 to end up being pathological stage T3, which is extra prostatic. Uh, 
Um, and the biopsy Gleason score is often downgraded. We'll see that uh, later on when we look at the Vancouver data uh, in the radical prostatectomy specimen, but conversely can, can often be upgraded too. So to address this problem of all these definitions, um, the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Group uh, had, a look, had a look at this and they analysed the rates of PSA recurrence using eight of these definitions that are around um, and they examined the data from their own uh, group of four, over 4,700 patients who were undergoing ro- radical prostatectomy. So these are just surgical patients. They actually did find that PSA recurrence was significantly greater in the high-risk definitions than in the non-high-risk patients and that was across the board for all definitions. So that's good. But amongst those high-risk definitions, there was great variability. And in fact, the five-year PSA relapse-free probability varied as much as between 50 and 80%. Incidentally, they also found that the deep D'Amico definition that I mentioned before was actually associated with a low PSA recurrence and they questioned, therefore, the appropriateness of that. On the the flip side, um, definitions with high PSA recurrence after surgery alone uh, were the one put forward by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, which you can see there, and in, in, in fact that's the one that we have used in our uh, analysis here. And they also, uh, I guess not surprisingly, uh, mentioned that the Catan nomogram, if it was used uh, such that the, it was, uh, the five-year progression-free prob- probability was 50% or less, gave a high risk of PSA recurrence. Now, this nomogram was the older version and they used just PSA, clinical stage and, and biopsy Gleason score, which I mentioned before. But if you look at the uh, nomogram or the MSK nomogram website now, you'll find that they're also incorporating uh, age, patient age but also um, percentage of cause positive on the biopsy. So, the authors of this paper are arguing for the use of, of nomograms, which are continuous, multivariable models, uh, to use them as the best best stratification tool. The, tr- the trouble then though is that where do you set your cut-off point? So if you're too stringent, you're going to miss some patients who will have occult metastases and you're going to preclude them from the multimodal therapy trials that are going on at the moment. But on the other hand, if you're, if you're too loose with your definition, then patients who actually have organ-confined disease, firstly, may, may forego curative therapy because it's thought that it's, uh, it's a dead loss, We're gonna, it's gonna, he's going to fail anyway, or conversely, they might be undergoing multimodal therapy and being over-treated when they only need monotherapy. So it's a problem. Like any study, there are a couple of weaknesses. It's subject to selection bias. This was just a surgical cohort. So it's fairly likely that they've selected out the smaller clinical T3 patients, perhaps smaller volume disease on the biopsy, and so we don't know if this represents all high-risk patients. And they only looked at PSA recurrence. Um, uh, Ideally, they'd be looking at the more far more clinically relevant uh, metastasis-free and cancer-specific survival. So just to summarise the problems with definition, uh, the standard criteria are yet to be determined. Uh, So this is a problem. So we now currently have multiple definitions, so we're looking at a heterogeneous group of patients in the literature, and these patients have a highly variable PSA recurrence rate. Nomograms probably offer the most accurate way of stratifying risk, Uh, and it would be good if we can incorporate as many relevant variables as possible, but we still need to decide on what an appropriate cut point is. Even if we accept a single definition, using the current parameters that we have available, we're still going to have a heterogeneous group. So the implication from this is that while most high-risk patients will fail monotherapy, there will be many that won't, and we'll we'll go on and talk about this more in in a moment. So who are these high-risk patients? Well, let's use the D'Amico definition, uh, and in an analysis of the CAPTURE data, 15% of patients presenting with prostate cancer nowadays are classified as high risk. And that's down a long way from 41% back in 1990. And that's, of course, due to the huge stage migration with PSA screening. Now, of note, the, ma- the vast majority now are because of the biopsy score of being Gleason uh, 8 or, or higher. So 62%. And the other two parameters are split fairly evenly, uh, making up the rest. (coughs) So what about current management? How are we currently managing these high-risk patients? So Denberg and colleagues uh, published on this in August last year in the BJU. They looked at the SEER cancer registry uh, from 1905 to 2001 and they were looking at a lot of men, 3,382 men with clinical T3 prostate cancer. And you'll see that 12% 
Only 12% underwent surgery for high-risk prostate cancer. More than half had radiotherapy and about a third had either androgen deprivation therapy or watchful waiting, but, but about a third had no local therapy at all. And even if a patient was less than 55, only 30% had surgery. Over this study period, local therapy did increase. It went up, not much, but it went up by 11%, from 58 to 69%. So, but what that means is that in 2001 there were 31% who were still getting no local therapy at all and 23% were less than 70 years old. So presumably, not always the case of course, but a lot of them are going to have, a lot of those patients are going to have uh, life expectancies which would otherwise be at least 10, 15 years. So the increase in local therapy was all due to increase in radiotherapy. It was up 20% but in fact the radical prostatectomy is halved they went down to 9%. So rate of local therapy is increasing but it's all because of radiotherapy. Surgery is decreasing and nearly a quarter of patients who might be eligible for local therapy were not getting any local therapy at all. So we've got to ask why why is this the way it is? As I said before, we don't know what the optimal management of these patients is. We know that there's a high risk of, by definition, there is a high risk of recurrence with monotherapy and I think that there's a concern amongst clinicians that with regard to the morbidity of local therapy, which is fair enough. But it leads to a sense of nihilism uh, and therefore they don't uh, suggest their patients have any local therapy. So these are the patients who are going on to get androgen deprivation therapy or observation, watchful waiting. On the other hand, you're faced with a patient who may be young and has aggressive disease. So clinicians feel the need to do something um, and that's where I suspect radiotherapy comes in but they want to avoid surgery because they know that there will be a high positive margin rate and I suspect there's still a feeling of uh, a high risk of morbidity with surgery but we'll talk about that in a moment. It's not necessarily the case at all. Just briefly covering watchful waiting, what's the natural history of high risk prostate cancer? There's a very high chance of the disease uh, progressing and causing death of the patient. There's uh, some data out there but probably the most recognisable is the uh, Connecticut Tumour Registry by Albertson uh, which demonstrates this. So I would put forward that watchful waiting is not appropriate in this group of patients unless of course the patient has a short life expectancy due to comorbidities or if the patient refuses to accept the risks of potential morbidity from treatment, local treatment. In terms of androgen deprivation therapy, it may defer disease progression and it may prolong survival but you've got to then balance that against all the potential complications of long-term uh, hormone therapy and in addition to that it's not going to be curative. So let's now go and have a look at the most common way patients with high-risk prostate cancer are treated today and this is with radiotherapy and androgen deprivation therapy. So I'm going to look principally at the uh, study which you'll all recognise by Boller and colleagues, an EORTC study, which compared a randomised control trial comparing radiotherapy to radiotherapy, uh, radiotherapy alone to radiotherapy plus three years of androgen deprivation therapy in high-risk patients. Their definition of high-risk uh, was a little bit different again. So this is where it makes it really hard to... One of, one of the reasons, of, of several reasons, that makes it really hard to compare studies between each other with the same modality, let alone studies amongst different modalities. Uh, So they were clinical T3, uh, Gleason scores 7 to 10, um, but 91% of these patients were clinical T3, so making up the vast majority. 412 patients between 87 and 1995, with a median age of uh, 71, so a little bit older than the typical cohort of surgical patients, and a median follow-up of five and a half years. Now here's another important thing uh, about analysing these studies, the PSA recurrence definition. Um, And as we know, the definition for radiotherapy is going to be different for for what we use for surgery. Their definition was PSA greater than 1.5 and increasing on two consecutive measures. And as you all know, they found that radiotherapy plus hormone therapy significantly uh, had a significantly better clinical disease-free and overall survival. So if we look then at the combined arm um, of radiotherapy and hormone therapy, their biochemical, no evidence of disease survival was 76% at five years. But 
the waters are a little muddied because of the 203 patients receiving radiotherapy or in the combined arm, only half of these patients had their testosterone level assessed and only 80% of those who did have their testosterone levels assessed were above castrate levels. So that's obviously going to factor into your uh, PSA recurrence rate. makes it a little hard to interpret. So I think it's probably a, a, a better thing to look at at five years is clinical disease-free survival. And their figure was 74%. Overall survival is actually not much more than that and I guess that reflects the population of patients they're treating. They're an older group of patients. Cancer-specific survival was, was uh, very good at 95%. So what I want to do is compare that group of patients uh, to what's probably the uh, best data that we have on high risk or on surgery for high risk patients. And this was published by the Mayo Clinic. It was in the BJU in 2005. Um, and it's the, it's the largest cohort we have of these patients with, a, with quite a long follow-up. Um, but it's a retrospective study um, and it's just patients who have had clinical T3 disease. But that, that means that hopefully it's a reasonable comparison, as best we, we can do anyway, uh, between, b- between this and the BOLA study. So median age was 66, a little younger, and median follow-up, as I mentioned, was pretty good at 10.3 years. That's uh, quite a long follow-up. Definition of PSA recurrence. PSA, just a single reading, greater than or equal to 0.4. Okay, so automatically we've got a different uh, definition of, of recurrence there and that's that we need to bear that in mind when we're looking at the results. Nearly a quarter of these patients received neoadjuvant hormone therapy, but of the 661 men who did not receive hormone therapy, a quarter of them had actually had pathological T2 prostate cancer, that is they had organ confined disease. So this is a very important finding of this so-called high risk group is that a large percentage of them are actually not high risk when you come to the pathological staging. In other words, they may be being overtreated by multimodal therapy. In this study, adjuvant therapy was defined as a therapy that was commenced three, less than three months after the surgery. 16% of patients had adjuvant radiotherapy but as many as half actually had adjuvant androgen deprivation therapy. And another important point coming out of this study is that the complication rates were compared to a cohort from the same institution of clinical T2 uh, patients and they found that they were much the same. So there was no significant difference uh, in morbidity. Biochemical... uh, Recurrence-free survival was 58% at five years. Now that uh, compares poorly versus the BOLA study, but you've got to remember that we're, we're looking at a different PSA definition, uh, and that probably accounts for at least some of that difference. And there's no mention, unfortunately, again, of uh, testosterone levels. This is a, an ongoing problem with this whole area because many of these patients are getting androgen deprivation therapy. It's really hard to know what the PSA means unless we've got a testosterone level at the same time excluding castrate level. But they do give a clinical disease-free survival of 85% and this actually compares favourably to the BOLA study of 74%. Overall survival is better but again probably reflecting a younger group of patients and cancer-specific survival was identical at 95% at five years. My feeling was that clinical disease-free survival is probably the most meaningful comparison at five years because you're going to expect that the cancer-specific survival to remain high after this fairly short time of follow-up. And on the other hand, but on the um, uh, biochemical-free survival, as I mentioned, is hampered by uh, the interference with androgen deprivation therapy. So because uh, this study had quite a long follow-up, they did an actuarial analysis out to 15 years And you can see there that at 15 years, 38% of patients are predicted to have a biochemical no evidence of disease survival in in what's thought to be a high-risk group with overall survival just over half and cancer-specific survival up to 79%. Again, there are weaknesses with the study. This is just a retrospective analysis uh, and it's at at a tertiary referral centre. So for those reasons, it may not be representative of all uh, clinical T3 cancers.
and it's uncontrolled for all the um, neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapies that patients receive. But I don't think that's such a big deal because we should be thinking of surgery in this group of patients in terms of multimodal therapy. I just want to quickly go over a couple of other smaller studies because they represent, again, a slightly different group of patients because of a different definition of high risk. Uh, and then we'll talk about our experience here at uh, Vancouver. So uh, Loeb and colleagues reported on a series by uh, Dr Bill Catalona of high-risk patients undergoing surgery. This was in this year's Gold Journal. But this is a much group of, a smaller group of patients, only 288, and it's a different group, as I mentioned. This group, the, de- the definition of high-risk here was clinical T2B with either Gleason 8 to 10 or a PSA greater than 15. And this, this group made up the bulk of this study, 88%. The other 12% were just clinical T3s. So it's a, it's a different group than what we've talked about just earlier on. Median follow-up was, was fairly long, at 7.3 years. And again, 54% of patients have received adjuvant radiotherapy with or without some androgen deprivation therapy. PSA recurrence definition was a little different. This time it's greater than 0.2, but confirmed by a second measurement. And they had a biochemical no evidence of disease rate of 39% at seven years, so about the same percentage uh, as the large surgical series from from Mayo at 15 years. But in this study, there was less adjuvant therapy, there's this uh, potentially stricter recurrence definition, and we may be talking about higher risk patients in this study because most of them had a combination of clinical T2B plus another high risk factor. And the cancer-specific survival uh, at 92% at seven years was very good. Similarly, uh, there's a series by the Cleveland Clinic uh, published in last year's Gold Journal of high-risk patients undergoing surgery. Similar numbers, 281, but there was a much more even spread of the uh, parameters that we used to determine high risk. So they were about in equal proportions, in fact. That is T3, PSA greater than 15, not 20, uh, etc. So 30% of these patients received neoadjuvant hormone therapy or neoadjuvant chemo as part of uh, trial protocols and they had a, a 70% rate of biochemical no evidence of disease survival at just 34 months. But this was with no adjuvant therapy. I think the reason I mention this particular one, uh, study is because of the complication rate. I think the uh, short follow-up time precludes any meaningful analysis of uh, cancer control. But in terms of complication rate, you can see here uh, of 10% versus only versus 7% for a contemporaneous series of radical prostatectomies for less advanced prostate cancer. In other words, much the same. What do you mean by complication rate? So complication rate includes both uh, all the post-operative potential complications, things like ileus, hemorrhage, etc., wound infection, but it also includes incontinence. I should, what I should point out is that there is, of course, going to be a difference with potency because when you do, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but when you do a, a radical prostatectomy for high-risk disease, most of the time you're going to be talking about doing a nerve sacrificing, not nerve sparing technique. So I'd like to move on now to what we found here at VGH. And as I mentioned before, this was our definition, one or more of these parameters for inclusion. So we looked at uh, the database that we have, which is prospectively updated, and we looked at uh, patients undergoing surgery who were were deemed high risk by this definition, by one of two surgeons at this institution. Patients who had neoadjuvant hormone therapy were included, but patients who had had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as there was just a handful of them, uh, these were part of trial protocols were excluded. And this, this left us with 211 men for analysis. And so we, we had a look at uh, all the uh, typical baseline factors. We also had a look at um, the number of high-risk factors and we also included the percentage of cause positive. And we compared these to our treatment outcomes by way of pathological stage and also PSA recurrence. Now you'll notice here that this is an extremely strict definition of PSA recurrence um, it's just a single reading greater than or equal to 0.2. But we, in fact, we, we know that there will be many patients who have a PSA of slightly greater than 0.2 who then never go on to have a higher PSA. Median age was 63 years, so again, typical of a surgical co- cohort. Uh, 
with a pretty decent median follow-up of uh, nearly four and a half years. So, these were the baseline parameters. 38% had a PSA greater than 20. 60% had a Gleason score greater than 7, so Gleason 8 to 10. And this is uh, very much in line with what the general population of high-risk patients is presenting with nowadays. And that, that's what I mentioned at the start with the capsule data. So, hopefully this therefore represents a good uh, sample of, of high-risk patients. Uh, number of calls positive, we decided to break that down into greater than 50% versus less than 50%, greater than or equal to 50% versus less than uh, and fairly even spread between those two categories. One quarter of patients had clinical T3 disease and as you can see in terms of the number of risk factors, and I should just clarify this, no, the risk factors we're talking about are PSA, Gleason score on biopsy and clinical T stage. So there's one, two or three risk factors and the vast majority just had the single one of those risk factors. So, what did we find in terms of pathological stage? Uh, 50%, these are all percentages, 50% actually had organ confined disease. Now, as you can see, 72%, so the majority of patients had neoadjuvant hormone therapy and we know that neoadjuvant hormone therapy will shrink the gland and the cancer uh, and you will get a lower positive margin rate which unfortunately doesn't seem to uh, transfer into uh, recurrence, PSA recurrence. Uh, 21% were specimen confined, that is they were pathological T3 but margin negative and 23% uh, were margin positive. The vast majority of these were pathological T3 uh, and as you can see 6% lymph node positive. Just looking at the patients who did not have neoadjuvant hormone therapy and the change of Gleason score between the biopsy and the pathological specimen, it was interesting to note that as many as 37% were downgraded. Now, as you saw before, 60%, though the majority of these patients were actually included as high-risk patients because of their biopsy Gleason score. Um, and a, a lot of these uh, patients are being downgraded. Now, not all of these are 8 to 10 down to 7. Some of them are 7 down to 6. But it's just interesting to note. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, I was, I was actually just about to uh, mention exactly that, and th this is probably an explanation as to why this occurred. Is that uh, the biopsies were one uh, often done outside this institution, and two usually not sent in for uh, central review by uropathologists. So that may account for the for the changes there. So let's look at the uh, PSA recurrence rate. So overall, the rate of biochemical no evidence of disease survival was 68.4%. This is at a median of nearly four and a half years. Uh, there was adjuvant therapy in only 3.3% uh, and the median time to recurrence, as you can see there, is 21 months. So if you then, uh, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve of that, and if you then uh, do the uh, actuarial uh, statistics on this, we had a 40.7% um, recurrence, uh, beg your pardon, 40.7% um, biochemical no evidence of disease survival rate at, out to 10 years. When 50% of patients are failing at <coughs> Yeah. Okay. So, 41% of patients um, who had PSA recurrence then went on to receive salvage radiotherapy. Um, unfortunately, we really don't have sufficient data on levels of testosterone in these patients to in include a potential lasting effect of, uh, first of all, neoadjuvant therapy on PSA recurrence rate, although that's, if you, it's very unlikely that that is a major factor because it's, it's before the surgery. There will be some lasting effect, but it should wear off quickly. What's probably more relevant is that we don't have uh, the T levels to exclude this effect of hormone therapy in the patients who have had salvage radiotherapy plus androgen depriva deprivation therapy. So we can't determine what the PSA re-recurrence rate is at this point. 
So what we then did is compared the baseline parameters to risk of PSA recurrence to see which of these were predictive and we found that the PSA was uh, predictive. Um, it was at least when we compared overall numbers uh, by a Fisher exact test but when we compared by way of Kaplan-Meier curves it was not. Uh, there was no significant difference uh, with the biopsy Gleason score compared to uh, PSA recurrence and that, uh, that fits with the, the findings we had of uh, our, our biopsy scores um, which, of which 30, more than 30% were actually downgraded. Um, percentage cause positive on biopsy um, was in fact predictive uh, of PSA recurrence. So you can see quite a, a marked difference there on the Kaplan-Meier curves. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, clinical stage on the other hand was not uh, significantly different and so what this tells us is that uh, the percentage biopsy cause is probably a much more accurate marker of uh, tumour volume than clinical stage. And we also looked at the number of those three risk factors, one, two or three, bearing in mind that only 3% of patients had the three risk factors but there was certainly uh, a marked difference there and that was statistically significant. There was no difference uh, in patients who had had, whether they'd had neoadjuvant hormone therapy or not. So we then performed a multivariate analysis uh, looking at, and, and this then determines the independent predictors of PSA recurrence and we found that PSA still held up as a, an independent predictor and so did the percentage of biopsy cores that were positive. And as I mentioned, that probably means that it's a more accurate indicator of tumour volume. So just to summarise our experience, this is a cohort which may be typical of the current high-risk patients, generally speaking, because 60% of them presented with a, an elevated uh, biopsy score. And we achieved good biochemical no evidence of disease rates with surgery as part of multimodal therapy and, and comparable to other published series. And as I mentioned just now, uh, it was consistent with other data supporting the use of uh, percentage of po positive biopsy cores as a parameter for stratifying risk. So what is the case for surgery in these patients? Well, in order for it to be a standard option, we first need to show that there is equivalence or even lower clinical progression rates compared to what is considered the standard treatment of radiotherapy plus androgen deprivation therapy, as long as there is also, in addition to that, acceptable morbidity. And I think from, although we, can't, we can certainly not prove it unless we have a, have a head-to-head uh, randomised control trial. There is literature out there which does appear to support this. But in addition to that, what other advantages might surgery offer? So there's the issue of extended pelvic lymph node dissection and it might be that this actually increases further cancer-specific survival. However, up till now we've got conflicting data on this from different small single institution series. So Joslyn and Canetti examined the SEER database and this was published in uh, last year's Gold Journal. They looked at over 13,000 patients who'd had radical prostatectomy between the years 88 and 91. And they did find that patients who had had more lymph nodes removed had a decreased risk of prostate cancer specific, specific mortality. They found if, that if more than four lymph nodes were removed compared to low, no lymphadenectomy, regardless of lymph node involvement, that there was a decreased risk of cancer-specific mortality. They found that if you removed greater than 10 lymph nodes removed and the lymph nodes were negative compared to not doing a lymphadenectomy, that this also uh, led to a decreased risk of prostate cancer-specific mortality. So what's the explanation for this? Well, maybe there are micrometastases that are missed by standard histological analysis that are being removed and there is evidence out there that this may be, may be happening. So the other thing about, the other uh, advantage of extended pelvic lymph node dissection is that you will find more positive lymph nodes the more lymph nodes you take out. So not only might it increase your cancer specific survival but it provides more accurate staging and we know from uh, data published by Messing that early androgen deprivation therapy in lymph node positive patients is beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. 
No. They didn't control for those. No. Yep. Yep. Okay. So another advantage, potential advantage of surgery is that it's certainly the most accurate way of staging these patients. Now you don't want to have to take a prostate out just to stage a patient but it is certainly the most accurate way of doing it. And the, the problem is that clinical staging as we've been through before remains inaccurate. As I mentioned also earlier, up to a quarter of patients thought to be high risk may in fact have organ confined disease. So these patients might only require monotherapy to be cured. Otherwise, these patients are subject to radiotherapy plus three years of hormone therapy or, if their clinician is more nihilistic, no definitive local therapy at all and denying these potentially curable patients of a cure. And also, as I just mentioned, if you do surgery and you find lymph nodes that are positive, then you can commence them straight on on the hormone therapy, which has been shown to improve survival. I think one of the main points I want to get across with this talk is this idea of multimodal therapy, which I think there's going to be a push towards in the future. We've now got a recent randomised control trials that do show at least a biochemical recurrence rate that has halved with adjuvant radiotherapy post, post-surgery. Now, these trials are either too small or the follow-up's too short to show a survival difference, but there is evidence that adjuvant therapy is of benefit. And also, based on the success of taxanes that we see in hormone refractory prostate cancer, there is hope for effectiveness in this setting of the high-risk localised prostate cancer uh, group of patients. Surgery as the primary definitive treatment gives you full range of adjuvant therapies as they're required. So you know what you're dealing with at the start and if you find that there, is, there are adverse features on the pathology, you can then go on to give radiotherapy or angiotrypation therapy and possibly even chemotherapy and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, in contrast, if the patient has had radiotherapy as the primary treatment and it fails, salvage surgery is less desirable because of the high rate of complications, incontinence, urethral stricture, even fistula. So I think multimodal therapy, is, is a, the, the concept is especially important in this group of patients given their likelihood of progression with monotherapy and it allows a matching of the treatment intensity to the aggressiveness of disease, which makes sense. So there's also a potentially improved survival even if patients do progress to metastatic prostate cancer. And this was quite an interesting study done by uh, Thompson and colleagues and published in the Journal of Urology in 2002. And it was based on the evidence that, we'd found, or that had been found in renal cell carcinoma but also ovarian cancer uh, whereby removal of the primary tumour was resulting in improved survival. So they went and reanalyzed a group of patients that were studied for a completely different re- reason. It was the SWOG 8894 trial which compared orchidectomy versus orchidectomy and flutamide in men with metastatic prostate cancer. Of these 1,200 men, 148 of them had undergone a previous radical prostatectomy. They actually found that there was a significant decrease in the risk of death if the patient had had surgery compared to if the patient had, had not had surgery. Conversely, they also found that the risk of death actually increased if the patient had had radiotherapy. So what's the explanation from this? Well, maybe by removing the primary tumour, you are preventing new metastases developing or spreading from that primary tumour and therefore translating into improved survival. But you've got to bear in mind that there are major limitations with this study. This study was a reanalysis of patients of a completely, uh, f- that were on trial for a completely different reason. So there's a potential for very uh, significant selection bias. For example, the clinical stage of diagnosis was not even known of these, of these patients. But it makes you think and it's certainly hypothesis generating. Surgery offers excellent local control. Um, we know that wide resection does reduce positive margins. Uh, a study... Uh, published in 
2005 in the Gold Journal showed that a positive margin rate was reduced in, in high-risk patients from 55% down to 16% if a wide resection was done. And so this may therefore reduce uh, the symptoms that you can get from local recurrence. If you do have local recurrence, which is not that uncommon with radiotherapy, this can lead to significant quality of life issues, bladder outlet obstruction, hematuria, pelvic pain and upper tract obstruction. And 69% of post-radiotherapy local recurrence uh, patients required surgical intervention, most commonly a TURP, but many of these patients then were then incontinent. As you'll know, surgery provides easier uh, follow-up. PSA monitoring after surgery is more straightforward. If the PSA is not less than 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.4, whichever your cutoff is that you use, at the first post-operative reading, you know that you've got residual disease. But if the PSA rises after being less than that, you know you've got a recurrence. Having said that, in the setting of multimodal therapy, we do need to measure testosterone if the patient has had neoadjuvant hormone therapy so that we know that the PSA is a true PSA and not just being affected by the hormone therapy. In contrast, it can be difficult to interpret uh, radiotherapy, uh, a PSA rather, uh, after radiotherapy. And it might take up to 18 months after radiotherapy for the PSA to completely nadir. PSA bounce might occur even up to three years after radiotherapy. And it's, it's not possible to differentiate between bounce from recurrence. However, now that the Phoenix definition is being used, which is Nadir plus two, this is less problem, problematic. So there's increased uncertainty after radiotherapy about what the PSA actually means and that's in addition to the lack of pathological staging as opposed to clinical staging. But as I mentioned before, until we have a head-to-head randomised control trial between surgery and radiotherapy, plus or minus the adjuvant therapies of chemo or, and or hormonal therapy, we're not going to know which of these have the better cancer control. So to summarise, there appears to be, with surgery for high-risk prostate cancer, comparable clinical progression to the current standard of treatment, at least uh, in, in North America. There is comparable morbidity of surgery in high-risk patients compared to surgery for the intermediate-risk patients, which is a standard treatment and and has acceptable morbidity. As I've just mentioned, extended pelvic lymph node dissection might further reduce uh, cancer-specific mortality. Surgery provides the most accurate staging, especially in conjunction with an extended pelvic lymph node dissection, which I think we should be doing for these patients. It allows the full gamut of uh, adjuvant therapies uh, and and or salvage radiotherapy um, as part of a multimodal therapy approach. I think that's the the key. Patients who do progress still may have improved survival because you've removed... We we don't know this for sure at all, in fact, and further study needs to be done, but patients who do progress uh, may in fact have improved survival because you've removed the primary tumour. You can get excellent local control with surgery and there is easier follow-up. So just to finish off, I'm just going to quickly touch on what we really need for the future. So as I've mentioned now, current patients that are categorised as high risk are a heterogeneous group. Some of them will have micrometastatic disease, some will have local extraprostatic disease, but some will have neither. So we need better staging. And ideally what we really need is a biomarker that's not only prostate cancer specific but also metastatic prostate cancer specific. And finally, most but not all of these patients will eventually progress. So we need better treatment. And I think multimodal therapy is likely to offer the best chance. A standard of care in other high risk cancers such as colorectal uh, and breast And as you can see here, there's a a swag of randomised control trials underway at the moment looking at both neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy as well as adjuvant uh, chemo-hormonal therapy uh, in in conjunction with surgery but also in conjunction uh, with radiotherapy. So until we have the results of these trials, 
Uh, we're still a little bit in, in the dark as, as to what the best treatment is, but hopefully uh, in the years to come when, we get, when the results come through, we'll be somewhat enlightened. Thank you very much for listening.